everyone, and welcome to uh, my presentation. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. And uh, today I wanted to share with you uh, results of our first implementation of an LLM-powered application that enhances and automates uh, customer centers. So uh, what I hope to, to give you here is an inspiration on how LLMs can be used in your customer centers, how you can use it to enhance the process, to improve the process. And one uh, other thing that I hope to uh, give you is some tips on how you can optimize costs of using LLMs while still maintaining their high performance. So let's get started. Okay, so here's the agenda for today. Uh, so before we move to the nitty gritty of the technical solution, I would like to introduce myself and my company just to give you a little bit of a, a context of uh, why I'm presenting that today and why we developed this application. Uh, then we'll move to the overview of the challenge. So we're gonna talk about the customer that we implemented the solution for and what was the particular problem that this customer center faced. Then we'll move to the uh, technical solution. We'll go through each of the components based on LLMs. And finally, we'll move to a model and cost, a model performance and cost comparison. Because we started with uh, OpenAI, but we did some tests on open source models, so I wanted to share some insight with you on those. And then we'll uh, go through some challenges that we faced and how they could be overcome in future implementations. Uh, so a few words about uh, me and uh, my company. So uh, at CK Delta, we develop intelligent applications that try to uh, solve f uh, two problems. So reducing the cost that businesses have, increase their revenue, but also uh, while maintaining sustainability and safety. So some of the areas, some of the industry that we focus on, they are very uh, infrastructure heavy. So we mostly operate uh, in utility sector, in logistic transport. So you can imagine how uh, infrastructure heavy those uh, data sets are. And uh, this LLM application was developed on one of the uh, companies in our utility sector, uh, in particular an uh, energy company. And one last thing before I, I move forward is that uh, CK Delta is a part of uh, CK Hutchison uh, Group, and which is a big conglomerate, and we develop products both internally and externally. So this product that I want to talk about, um, me and my team developed uh, that's this product. I'm a data scientist at CK Delta. And uh, recently, as you can imagine, we've been working a lot with LLMs, so this has been our uh, primary, uh, primary focus in the last uh, month or year. Um, and apart from uh, doing predictive modeling at CK Delta for utilities and logistics mostly, I'm also interested in MLOps implementations, and uh, we do that at CK Delta as well. So each of our products is, um, uh, has those MLOps components to make sure that those solutions are reliable and scalable. Uh, so let's move to the overview of the challenge. So the challenge was uh, primarily um, focused around this particular customer that we faced. So the customer that I'm talking about, uh, it's a UK Power Networks, and it's one of the largest uh, electricity distributor in the UK. And to give you some, uh, to give it the scale of how it operates, it uh, supplies energy to 19 million people across the UK. Uh, mostly in London, but also southeast and east of England. And the customer center that we've worked with, uh, it's a B2B customer center. So there are 20 agents working full time on answering any queries, uh, requests that engineers have to UK Power Networks. So as you can imagine, some of those uh, requests can be really complicated because these are not just uh, queries like, oh, my. Uh, my electricity doesn't work, I don't have electricity. It's more of a technical uh, support to, to those customers. 
And this customer center, uh, they use an email as a main uh, channel of communication. But this use case is very common across different industries, across different modes of uh, communication, and it can be scaled to, to other businesses as well. Uh, so the main problem of this customer center was the slow uh, response time. So as I mentioned, those requests were often very complicated, very long, so it took time for the agents to answer uh, those questions and requests. And one other thing that um, led to the slow response time was the way how UK Power Networks handled uh, those emails. So there was a team leader who was a very knowledgeable person, an experienced person, but the way they handled those emails was the team leader manually read those emails and distributed them across the team. So they spent three hours every day just going through the emails and assigning them to particular team members based on their urgency, based on their importance. So it was a very manual process and therefore uh, prone to error. Those slow response times led to both lower cast customer satisfaction, but also because it's an uh, electricity, uh, electricity industry, it's a public sector, it also had a significant risk of regulatory fines. So there was one particular group of emails that if they weren't answered in a specific time, the UKPN uh, risked uh, getting fined with really big fines. So uh, apart from just customer satisfaction, there was also this other component of regulatory fines. And one problem related to that was that we observed that there is an around 10% increase year to year. So this problem would only escalate in, in the future. So it's not something that could have been uh, just um, ignored and not addressed. And as I already mentioned, the queries that uh, reached UK Power Networks, they were long and complex, so they needed additional time to, uh, for the agents to go through. So the solution that we needed to develop needed to address two things. It needed to speed up the process uh, of uh, replying to those emails, but also to improve the process so that it wasn't that prone to error as it was before. So here is a quick summary of what we did to achieve this goal. So we had four LLM-based components. The first one was email categorization. So this is something that the team leader used to do manually, but we moved this task, automated it, and uh, gave it to LLMs to do it in seconds rather than in days. The second component was email sentiment, and it was a bit different than email categorization because it was more about a gut feeling that those agents had. So they noticed that there are some emails that are more urgent, they seem like the customer seems impatient, and they, need, they wanted to address that separately. The third component was email summarization. And as I mentioned, because those uh, queries were long, they were complex, just going through a uh, 15 email chain of, e uh, chain of emails uh, was very lengthy. And uh, providing a summary at the very top gave an agent an overview of what the conversation is about in just a second, rather than uh, having them read through, read through it all. And finally, the last component was drafting response. Uh, so it was also the aim of the response was to, uh, for, the, for the agents to spend less time on uh, going back to the customers. And this solution had uh, very tangible benefits, both for UK Power Networks and for the customers. So the first uh, benefit is very time related. So UK Power Networks were, was able to save around two and a half, three hours every day uh, just by automating this process of email categorization. And you may think that three hours, it's not a lot, but if you look at the working hours, it's 30% of their time saved every day to provide more personalized support, to provide support to the most complex queries. Um, doing some of the th things automatically using LLMs helped to save all that time. Another benefit was, uh, as I mentioned, those, uh, this manual process of reviewing emails was often pr prone to errors, even though, that the even though the agents and the team leader were very knowledgeable, experienced people. But still, because it, was ne it needed to be done quickly, there was often mistakes that uh, led to regulatory fines. So we improved the email classification by 19%. 
uh, due to our um, LLM that we implemented for email categorization. And finally, the time needed to process an email got down from one and a half days to just five, 10 seconds, because this is how much time needed to be spent to uh, produce all of those outputs uh, of the LLMs that I mentioned. Uh, so now let's go into the technical uh, solution, now that we have an overview of the problem and what components the solution had. Uh, so in this, in, in this particular implementation, we partner with uh, Databricks and Microsoft uh, to build an end-to-end -end solution, an Outlook solution, that had very minimal changes to the business-as-usual uh, process. So it meant that the agents uh, didn't have to adjust to any major changes in their process. Everything was as it was before, plus those additional components that LLMs produced. So let's see what happens when a new email reaches an inbox. So we have a new email, and a new email triggers a workflow in Azure Logic Apps. This workflow uh, saves both the email body and all of the email attachments in Azure Blob Storage so that our LLMs can have this data to work with. In the next step, uh, those, uh, this information was loaded to Databricks. Um, our LLMs were retrieved from model registry and we performed those four tasks uh, related to LLM. So email uh, classification, email sentiment classification, email summaries, and uh, responses. Once those model outputs were ready, another uh, Azure Logic App workflow was triggered, and it fed those results to back to Outlook. So what the agents, uh, so what the agents saw uh, was the same email that they would usually see, but it has some additional components. So it had the email category and email sentiment as tags in Outlooks, and email summary and response in the body of the email in a different font and color just to have like a bit of a difference, but it was still the same email that they worked with, just with those additional helpful components that could help them to speed up the process. So I just briefly mentioned those, mentioned those four components based on LLMs, but let's just focus on them because this is the main uh, topic of, of this presentation. So what I haven't mentioned is the initial step, because this is the email cleaning was not something that agents or customers uh, have seen. But this was also like the most important part, because the, um, the level of email cleaning, how well it cl cleaned the emails, it's directly impacted the email classification results, the email summaries. So getting rid of that noise, but uh, still maintaining the most important information was crucial for the next parts that the LLMs processed. But the email body cleaning um, was also handled by an LLM. Uh, we had uh, disclaimers, warnings, signatures, so basically all that noise removed from emails to just have like a clean, uh, straight to the point information that we could work with. Once we had that, we moved to a second part, which was email classification. And we classified emails into three main categories, jobs, questions, and lower priority emails. We also assigned a separate, different category, unknown, if an LLM had a problem with uh, determining the, uh, the category of emails. The next step was getting the email sentiment. And we had two types of sentiment. So we had urgent and low pressure emails. But uh, you can understand that as a um, neutral versus negative uh, sentiment. So it's, it translates to that, but this was the wording that the customer wanted to use. And the rest of the flow really depended on the email classification results, because there were different actions on each uh, category. So for the unknown category, a manual review by an agent was needed to assess what type of email reached the inbox. For uh, lower priority emails, there was no action needed. This was a group, of, a group of emails that the agents did not focus on. They didn't have any SLAs or penalties or anything um, that they needed to take care of. But what they wanted to uh, have was uh, all of the next steps related to jobs and questions. So first, the, the next LLM uh, part was the email summaries. And what we needed to retrieve in the summary 
what the customer wanted to retrieve was what their customer requested. So that was the main point. But also they wanted to have all of the customer details that were provided in the email body. So the addresses, and names, phone numbers, and all of this personal data that they uh, cared about. And finally, there was lots of jargon and abbreviations inside those emails. And as I mentioned, there were often long chains of emails. So before an email reached this customer center, it might have been in different departments at UK Power Networks. It might have gotten through uh, different people. So they wanted to have a list of the departments that it has already reached and all of the internal num numbers, so like Salesforce, job numbers, anything that was mentioned inside the email. And finally, uh, email responses. Um, the draft of the response was hugely based on a template that, uh, that agents used. So they had a bunch of templates for different scenarios that an LLM filled with customer details that were provided inside uh, the email body. So this is an uh, overview of the technical uh, solution. But now let's get into each of those components uh, to give you a bit of a a bit of more insight on what exactly models we used and how they performed. So for email classification, as I mentioned, that there, there were three different categories that uh, the agents wanted to um, assess. The first one was called jobs, and this was the most important uh, category of emails. So there weren't of equal importance. This was the one that they really wanted to focus on, and these were all of the customer requests on UKPN's actions. And some of the requests uh, included uh, new connections, upgrade, downgrades, anything that happened on uh, UKPN's network. And agents had their own ways, manual ways, of um, assessing whether an email was a job or not. And what they looked at was whether an email had any attachments. But it wasn't a very straightforward rule because there might have been emails that had attachments but weren't jobs. And there were also emails that had the attachment pasted straight into the email body rather than attached to, uh, to the email itself. So this is a very brief example of how an email job could look like. So it's very brief and it only mentioned that there was a uh, attachment, uh, but as I mentioned, the attachment itself or the content of the attachment might have been uh, included inside the email. The second category was called questions, and these were more uh, indirect um, uh, emails. So there were uh, some requests about how jobs are going, is there any progress, but also any other questions that might potentially lead to creating new jobs. And it was the most difficult task for uh, the agents to, uh, to find the difference between jobs and questions because those usually came together or were uh, easily confused between each other. And how they uh, assessed whether a, it was a question or not was by looking through the chain of emails and seeing if there was any other uh, department that has already worked on this. That, then it usually meant that the email was a question. And here's an example of a question email. Uh, as you can see, it's a bit longer uh, than the previous one. And what it usually has is some information, some background about the customer, their, uh, their problem that they're facing with, and any questions, is that possible or not? So these were the types of emails that fell into this category. And finally, lower priority emails, those are the emails that probably we are all very familiar with. So all of the spam emails, uh, all of the notifications about uh, annual leave or meeting uh, acceptance. And this category was often um, possible to distinguish based on the subject line. So there were some patterns similar for all types of lower priority emails. And here's an example of, of this kind of email that we're uh, all familiar with. So before I move to the model itself, I just wanted to highlight what was the evaluation data set in, in this case. So we selected six, 600 emails with um, equal distribution of each category. Uh, these were randomly selected emails. And at the first glance, it might seem that 600, this is not a lot, but um, labeling those emails was not very straightforward. So as I said, and ag the agents had their ways of assessing what was the category, but they did not correct it if there wasn't any mistake. 
So we had to really check it example by example to see whether the category was assessed correctly. And all of the emails was, were cleaned from any post-processing techniques to make sure that this is just the raw uh, email text that the agents would look at. So going to the classification results, um, we used, for this task we used uh, OpenAI uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo, and we chose this model because of two reasons. So why we chose OpenAI? We had two months to uh, develop this uh, application. So this was not a lot. We had four uh, components. And using OpenAI allowed us for very fast iterations that are crucial at early stages of development. So in just two months' time, we were able to assess whether LLMs are fit for this kind of problem or not. What are the initial results that we could expect? So this was one of the reasons why we chose OpenAI. And why we chose uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo instead of something else? So at this point in time, GPT 3.5 Turbo was, and still is, 60 times less expensive than GPT 4. So even though GPT 4 might have had a, a bit of a better uh, result, it was not 60 times better. So that's why uh, we kind of chose this on the model performance versus cost um, basis. And for this task, we used a uh, few shot learning. So we had a, a couple of examples that we fed to the prompt uh, to help the LLM uh, figure out the email categories. And we attained uh, overall accuracy of 75%. But what we really focused on in this task was, um, uh, was really focusing on that recall. Because what the agents cared about the most was identifying all the jobs. Identifying all jobs meant that they were free of any regu regulatory fines and that nobody got in trouble, basically. So uh, we had a couple of iterations of this model to tune uh, recall. And um, we chose the, finally the version of the model that had the highest recall, even though the accuracy was not the highest of all the models that we tried. One other metric that is worth uh, noting here is how many unknown categories have been uh, assigned. So only around one and a half percent of emails required manual review from the agents. And this is a very important metric because it meant how much could be really automated and how much needed, to, needed still that manual review. So moving to the next component, which is the email sentiment classification. As I mentioned, even though this is also a classification, it was slightly different. It was more based on the gut feeling that the agents had rather than a strict SLA um, problem. And first group, first class that we had were the urgent emails. And those emails were characterized by some impatience in the tone that the customer used. There were often very long emails without any clear resolution or a person that handled this case. Um, while the low pressure email, the neutral ones, were the typical emails that reached the inbox. So they were formal, there was like nothing that, um, that suggested any impatience and frustration on the customer side. And one thing is that they could also be long, that they could also include a couple of different departments working on it, but they had a, a person mentioned in one of the emails that already handled or was handling. Uh, this problem. And uh, the results of the email, class, uh, email sentiment classification um, was 93% accuracy while uh, having 80% of recall. So again, we used few shot learning with OpenAI GPT 3.5 Turbo, but this problem was slightly uh, more complex to evaluate just because with the initial classification, we had some idea about the labels. Here, it was purely based on the feeling that the agents had. So what we did uh, was collecting some of the examples from the agents and then feeding them uh, to another LLM to populate those labels to have more examples. Moving to the next part, email summarization. This was uh, personally my uh, favorite task and it was very, um, very interesting to, to develop. It was also based on uh, OpenAI. Um, but 
there were three layers of evaluation that we did here. So first were the typical NLP metrics that we probably uh, all know, and we focused on the semantic textual overlap, just because we didn't really care about having the same wording both in the email and in the summary. What we really wanted to get from the email was the main point, to have this main point um, included in the summary. So we achieved 83% of semantic textual overlap, but those NLB metrics might not be robust enough to represent how good a summary was. So what we did additionally was uh, calculating metrics based on the reading time because this was the main problem that this customer center uh, faced with. So for jobs, so the uh, assumption here is that we read around 200 words per minute. This is like a standard uh, number of words that we, uh, we can read. And for jobs, the decrease in time needed to review a summary versus the full chain of emails was around 80%. So the agents could save 83% of the time reading the summary versus the whole chain of emails. And the difference for questions was even larger. It was more about 90%. Because as I mentioned, the questions that reach UK Power Networks, they were often uh, very lengthy. They weren't straight to the point. So an agent really need, needed to focus on the whole chain to get just one important sentence that was mentioned there. Another layer of evaluation uh, that we did was a manual evaluation with the agents. So we provided them with both examples of summaries and the full emails for them to assess whether the emails really the summaries really included the most important information, that nothing was uh, incorrect, that the abbreviation that the summary used were the same as in the main email. And they confirmed that they were actually happy with the, with, with the summaries and uh, proved that they, they were reliable enough to work with. And moving to the last LLM component, the email responses. So this task uh, turned out to be the most difficult ones. And we started with a very small scope. So we initially thought that, OK, we'll, we'll tackle this. We'll have a number of different scenarios that we'll cover. But because of the subjectivity, both in the way that customers send emails, but also as the agent reply to those emails, led us to um, focusing on a couple of scenarios, the most common ones, and matching them with templates that uh, agents use to reply. So we focus on three um, scenarios that an email could follow. So these are just examples that this particular customer center used because it's an electricity company. That's why we focused on few sizes, a capacity of a connection and a network. And once we identified this scenario in an email, we chose a template, filled it with details that were present in the email, and we addressed the customer uh, query. So we had those two LLMs components, first assessing whether an email matches the scenario, and second one, picking the template and filling it with customer details. But as I mentioned, this task uh, proved to be the most difficult ones, and in the future implementations, uh, we definitely need to uh, explore this topic more. Because even though we were able to identify 100% of emails that needed a reply based on those scenarios. We also identified the ones that did not really need a uh, reply, but we still provided it. So we think that having more labeled examples and working closely with uh, this customer center um, is the key to make this solution more robust. And we also believe that focusing on a narrow case scenario and extending it to more and more examples is the way to go because it gives us uh, some confidence from the very start and allows us to build upon that rather than trying to fix it from a very high level. So these were the four components, LLM components, that uh, I wanted to share with you. But before we wrap up, I wanted to um, also mention how OpenAI performed uh, compared to other methods that we used. So as I mentioned, there are benefits to using OpenAI, and it allowed us to 
to fast iterations, very important early stages of development. Through prompt engineering, we were able to, add, uh, to get really good results. But there are also downsides to it. So first of all, OpenAI comes at a cost, and that cost is strictly related to the number of tokens that we need for inference. And seeing this uh, yearly increase in the number of emails gave us a bit of a concern that this, um, that this solution will be more costly with time. So that's why we also tested open source models, open source LLMs, uh, to see what is the difference between uh, those two, both in cost and performance. So we started with tests uh, of Distilbert, uh, a hugging face model. And this model is relatively small compar compared to OpenAI uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo, because this model has only uh, around 100 million um, parameters, while uh, this GPT model had over 170 billion uh, parameters. So you can see the difference in scale here. But when you look at the performance, you can see that it's actually not that far away from OpenAI. So the biggest difference that we saw was in, oops, sorry. Okay, that was a spoiler. Um, so the biggest difference was uh, uh, observed in jobs. But as I said, we really optimized the prompt for OpenAI to tackle all of those job emails. So we believe that fine-tuning more uh, the Distilbert model um, and tweaking it more to those types of emails could make those results even better at a very uh, different cost in using OpenAI. Other models that we tested were the Llama 2 models. Um, so we tested uh, the 13 billion and the 70 billion version. We also tested the 7 billion, but it had very bad results for this task, so it's not even, uh, even here. Uh, we also fine-tuned it on 600 emails, just to give a bit of a context how uh, emails coming to uh, UKPN were. But the results were not as good as uh, for Distilbert. Uh, what's also, um, what was also concerning was the differences in different types of email, how the performance dropped, for example, for questions. And especially the 70 billion model, these, this is a huge model. It was not really comparable to the previously mentioned Distilbert. So of course, it also was associated with higher costs. So this is an overview of a model performance comparison. But what businesses nowadays are also really looking into is optimizing, optimizing the costs. So getting good results with LLMs is not as difficult as getting them at a significantly lower cost. So there are a couple of assumptions that we made before moving to the cost comparison. So first assumption was that we process around seven, we need around three million tokens uh, every hour uh, for inference, and it's based on uh, the fact that the, this customer center got around uh, 400 emails daily, but those emails were pretty lengthy, as I mentioned. There were usually chains of emails. Another assumption was that the model needed to run 240 hours every month. Uh, so we needed, needed to have those, those two facts taken into account while calculating costs. So let me walk you through this graph, which shows relative cost comparison for different methods. So on the x-axis, you can see the number of tokens that we use for inference. And on the y-axis, it's a relative cost. And it, as you can see, it doesn't have any particular numbers because it's not really the point. The point is that we have an overview how those different methods compare to each other. Because each company might have different discounts, both at Databricks and Microsoft or other platforms. So what we care about here in this graph is the relative comparison. So starting from OpenAI, the yellow line over here shows the cost of using OpenAI. And as you can see, it significantly increases with the number of tokens used. And this is the trend that we expect for this kind of problem because we saw this growth year by year. Moving to the next part, um, those red lines over here, 
These are the costs of using big GPU machines on Databricks. So the lower line is the cost of one machine, while the upper line is cost of two machines. And those huge machines, especially those two machines, uh, are needed to run a Llama to 70 billion model. So as you can see, using two GPU machines is almost always more expensive than using OpenAI. Only at 12 million tokens, it makes sense to consider it as an alternative for using OpenAI. So depending what is your particular use case, how many tokens uh, you expect to process, uh, this is something to keep in mind. And finally, the, uh, the blue lines over down on the bottom, these are the costs of using smaller CPU machines on Databricks. And those CPU machines are sufficient for smaller LLMs such as Distilbird, but also Roberta and uh, Llama 13 billion. So also you can see here that compared to the red lines, compared to the GPU machines, it makes sense to use those small models and small machines, whatever the um, whatever the scenario is, so whatever the number of tokens you use. So even at the 3 million token threshold that we observed in this particular task, it still gives us room for improvement for cost optimization if we use those open source models on smaller machines. So we can save up to 30% of the cost for two machines and 60% of the cost if we use just one machine and an open source LLM on it. So what I would like you to take away from, from this graph is that there are ways of opt optimizing the costs of LLMs. One of the solutions is to use small open source models such as Distilbert and new, the newest developed LLMs and using serverless endpoints to run those models on. This could be a way of making sure that the cost that you associate with LLMs is smaller. And of course, fine-tuning an LLM, maintaining a fine-tuned LLM, it comes at a cost, it comes at a cost of time and resources, and this is something that we need to keep in mind if we, if we have in our businesses. But those two ways are, are a good starting point uh, to start thinking about optimizing cost of LLMs. And another thing, it's not uh, directly associated with LLMs or open source versus open AI LLMs, but it's not that LLMs are fit for every problem. They might perform well at classification and things like that, but there are still those traditional machine learning techniques, deep learning techniques that we can utilize in these types of problems. So using LLMs for the most complex tasks and trying to utilize, for example, LSTMs for email classification is a way of making sure that our cost is as minimal as possible. So before, uh, before uh, ending, I would like to highlight some of the challenges and how they could be overcome, both in future implementation, but also for, for your businesses. So as I mentioned, one of the issues that we faced was high costs associated with OpenAI, and it was especially apparent for email cleaning because we needed to go through every single line of email and assess whether it was important for the context or not. And by using a more hybrid approach, so using good old regex for filtering some of the emails, but also, as I mentioned, LSTMs, uh, like GBM and uh, other models, uh, machine learning models rather than LLMs, uh, could be a way of reducing that cost. We can save the open source LLMs or open AI for the most complex tasks and tackle the rest with uh, other cheaper uh, techniques. For email classification, uh, the, the main problem we faced was the misclassification of job emails and what implications it might have. And one of the ways of, of making sure that we make as few mistakes as possible is using an LLM as a judge, as an additional layer of safety, but also to have, a, to have this misclassification intervention so that when an agent sees that an email is misclassified, they could change the tag and it automatically triggers uh, the, the flow that corrects the 
mistake. And it, th those kind of mistakes could be then analyzed by data scientists, by your engineers, to make sure that the LLMs um, work better with time. With sentiment, we can't really get away from working constantly with stakeholders that work with these kind of emails and using their input as a way of making model improvements. For email summarization, as I mentioned, the evaluation that we did was the, were those three steps of evaluation, but it's something that is a persistent problem across different businesses, how we actually evaluate email summaries. And again, uh, a good starting point here is using an LLM as a judge, who could, which could assess whether a uh, summary is reliable, whether it includes any hallucinations, whether it includes all the information that agents need. And fine-tuning an LLM and including this internal knowledge specific for the business is another way of making sure that the summaries are more robust, more fit to your businesses. And finally, the biggest risk with email responses is that they are directly exposed to customers. And this particular customer requested having a human in the loop, so they didn't want to have this uh, fully automated process. So this is an additional layer of safety that we have. But also we believe that focusing on a limited number of scenarios and growing from there is a way of, uh, of handling this problem. So we've talked about the benefits uh, of using LLMs for customer centers, and those benefits are tangible and quantifiable, both in case of time save, but also the improvement in performance. What we've also talked about is how OpenAI can be helpful uh, for managing email processing, and what are the advantages of using that of, in the early stages of development. But what we've also mentioned is that there is still potential for reducing the costs, the operating costs of using LLMs. And some of the methods that you could look into is using smaller open source models on end, uh, serverless endpoints and really making sure that the problem that you're faced with is fit for LLMs and that you cannot tackle it with, more, um, with cheaper techniques such as uh, neural networks uh, or machine learning, traditional machine learning. And what I would like to highlight here is that this was a very particular problem for this customer center, but this is a very broad topic. This is very common for different industries, for different modes of conduct, contact. And we have different customers coming to us um, in different industries, such as uh, transport or even pubs. We are Irish-based, so uh, pubs are important. Um, and they have very similar problems, even though uh, they have different types of um, different modes of communication with the customers. But still, there are some um, similarities between those problems. And this solution could be easily adapted to different industries and different modes of contact. What we really need to have is just historic data. The rest is just um, operating costs, and uh, it's it's very. Um, reusable across those different industries. And that's all what I wanted to share with you. Thanks so much for, for listening, and I'll be around if you have any questions. Thanks. <laughs>